governor's office multiple times a day. Okay. We're going to start. Vice Chair walked out, but she'll be back. Good, good afternoon, uh, Commissioners. Tom Stoll's county manager. Uh, and we're going to run today's uh, special meeting a little bit like a staff meeting. And before we do anything, I want to just kind of explain to uh, media what our weird uh, seating arrangements are today. But uh, as we all know, there's good practice uh, of health in community right now. And uh, part of that is six feet spacing. So I think you as Board of Health, we did the best we could in a confined condition day to get you guys six feet apart. So all five of you are here. Um, uh, and we'll go ahead and run the meeting. Um, I want to remind everybody the purpose of what the Board of Health is doing right now and the purpose of this meeting today is this, this, this board has been operating the last three weeks uh, with an abundance of caution as a theme and doing everything we possibly can, uh, can to flatten the curve of this virus spread. It's never been the intention to stop the virus, although we wish we could. We know we can't. Uh, we are in a mode to slow infection rates down so that our major um, hospital partners can keep up. Of course, here that's Wesley and Via Christi, as well as all of our local doctor offices. Uh, so that's the reason the board has taken the actions uh, that it has, and that's the reason the board will take any actions it will in the future for those two reasons. Uh, so for today, uh, really kind of four things. Um, the, re the meeting was called today because I think a majority of you uh, won the updates today from health professionals regarding uh, the progression of the virus and how it's moving or how we think it's moving through the state, best we can tell. Uh, Dr. Menz, I think, is en route, uh, but until that time, uh, I think Tim can get up here and talk to it a bit and and so can I. We both uh, we have been communicating uh, all day and all day yesterday. Um, we can also receive an update uh, regarding today's action in Johnson County in the uh, four county Kansas City metro region area. They took some actions today regarding further restrictions. And Justin Wagner uh, from our law department will get up and go over that, as well as uh, and Mr. Papoon is here also. Uh, and then we'll open it up for discussion of the board on potential actions uh, that Sedgwick County may want to take uh, as soon as tomorrow, uh, depending on the will of the board. Uh, and then I want to close up by uh, just telling you or uh, summarizing for you an action I took um, in the middle of the week regarding uh, equipment shortages and a plea I made uh, to the private sector to try to obtain some basic uh, safety materials for our workers, EMS, um, fire, and sheriff. So we'll finish up with that. So with that, Tim, I'll go ahead and let you grab the podium here. And Good afternoon, commissioners. I'll give you a brief update, things that have happened um, since Friday, and then I'll be open to any questions that you may have. Um, I came uh, this afternoon from a meeting of... Uh, the incident command structure. The incident command structure has been operating for a number of weeks now, and they're meeting on the weekends. And um, we met again this week to talk about the testing procedures in anticipation of receiving additional testing materials. So there are a couple of different issues that um, we're looking for. We're looking for the medium so that we can take samples and then submit those samples to laboratories so they can perform the tests. And right now, the state laboratory just this afternoon indicated to us that because they are now seeing shortages, shortages of the reagent that they need to test samples that are submitted to them, they're they will be imposing reductions on the types of um, individuals that they will perform the tests for. And so right now, the emphasis is going to be on first responders, so law enforcement and uh, public health work workers. Um, hospital workers, folks like that, if they're showing symptoms, they would be um, eligible for the sampling and then testing individuals that are over the age of 60 and are showing symptoms. So again, that's going to be a fever, cough, and shortness of breath because those are uh, that's another high risk category. And then um, for, for, and then folks that are already in the hospital. So the hospitals will continue to do the testing that they're doing. So. 
Um, we make progress. We believe that we'll have additional materials as early as tomorrow um, so that we'll have the materials that we would need to be able to take samples. But uh, just as that happens, then we're starting to see some restrictions on the back end. The alternative is to work with private labs, and so we're in contact with uh, one of the private labs here in town. We believe that we'll have a contract with them within the next couple of days so that in the event that the KDHE Cahill lab won't be able to take samples, we'll be able to have those um, processed by a lab locally, and we'll be able to submit them to a lab locally. They do send them uh, um, out of state for testing, and so it takes longer to get those results back. And then, as you all know and you're aware, you've seen things that there are faster tests um, that are being developed, and hopefully we'll see those results quicker as well. So um, that's the most recent word that we have. We continue to, to practice and prepare for the point in time that we have additional um, sample-taking materials, and I think we'll maybe even run a test fairly quickly so that once those materials are much more available, um, and it's more, uh, and we see more folks that meet those testing criteria, we'll be able to run them through. So we're preparing for that in anticipation of a time when all the materials appear both here and then at the lab so that they have the reagents that they need to, to, to run those tests. I'd be happy to answer any questions, or I could turn it over to Dr. Menz because he's here as well. <clears throat> Tim, what, what, what was the turnaround time about? On the uh, if you send out tests, is if we're able to to send them to the KDHE okay. lab here in state, Thanks. they're usually turning those around within a 24-hour period. Right. Um, if we have to use one of the private labs right now, those are going out of state, and we get those results back in four or five days. And so there's an appeal to be able to do them uh, within state because folks get the information right. much quicker. And yeah. how many can our state lab produce a day? Uh, <sighs> The data that I have on that is not current, or it's not new. Um, we were able to process about 100 per day. I know that they were trying to identify an additional lab, and maybe um, Representative Hawkins has some additional information. They were trying to acquire the, the, the machine that would be able to allow them to double that, and then they were also looking to add part-time or um, some staff so that they could maybe run multiple shifts. Do you know, Dan? Yeah, they're, they're ramping up. Yes, I'm Dan Hawkins, Majority Leader of the House of Representatives, and they are ramping up to increase the amount. Um, they are looking at moving to extra shifts, but they also have uh, some private um, labs that have come on board, which is really helping that situation out. So we'll, as those private labs come on board, we'll be able to ramp up a lot faster. No, it's just as they as they get them certified, there, there's some certifications that have to come along with that. We do have two here in town, so that are certified. Does ramping up mean doubling? Does it mean like what? what yeah, does that mean? It, and it takes a while because they have to they have to train people. There's some special training to do those tests, uh, so it's not something they can just do overnight. They could get the machine, the extra machine, to do it, uh, but then they have to train those and have those people certified according to the testing procedures. So it takes them a while to do that. Thanks, Dan. I have a question. So if someone doesn't meet these three classes, they're not a health worker, they're not over 60 with fever, cough, and shortness of breath, and they're not inside the hospital receiving services there, then someone calls and says, I've got two of the symptoms or I'm concerned I may be with someone who who I think has the virus or whatever, are we keeping track of those number of the numbers of people who make those calls? I know Adrian the other day said she had 140 over overnight, but I'm just wondering if, if we're collecting that. But is that data being fed up to KDHE? Is there a collector of that data? Or it sounds like the tests are being collected, whether they're positive or negative tests. But if they're not being tested and someone makes that call, is that data being collected anywhere? That I think that our epidemiologists are, are tracking the, those um, screenings that they're doing. So again, what we encourage folks to do is call 211, and they're going to ask a, a first-level set of screening questions, talk to folks to see about whether or not they would be appropriate to have a sample taken. If they are, then they're going to be referred to health department staff, and so we've got professional staff that will then follow up with them, and if they're appropriate for a screening, then we would schedule that screening with, with the limited number of materials that we have now. 
the folks that aren't meeting that criteria have been talked to by a professional that is going to help give them some direction on what they need to do, how they need to self-monitor, because that's the other thing is we want folks to pay attention to their own symptoms, and if those symptoms change, then we need them to call back so that we can, again, assess them and determine whether or not they've reached a threshold where we want to screen uh, them. I'm just trying to understand. So, if, But, again, so if someone's not tested specifically, but they say they have a couple of the symptoms, maybe they were around somebody else that has traveled, or maybe they traveled themselves, if they're not tested, we might encourage them to, to like shelter in place or isolate or quarantine, but we're not going to test them. So that data is still being collected, though. There, there are people that potentially have the virus. We just have not, we don't, we haven't tested them, so we don't know the status. What, what we're doing, we, yeah, of course, we do not know their status because they haven't been tested. So we're not going to take their sample if they don't meet those the high level of criteria, but we will track whether, and we'll talk to them about how they can self-monitor and when they need to call back. Okay, I'm not sure I'm, I appreciate the answer. I'm sure it's a good, I'm sure it's a good answer, but again, knowing that Adrian said she had 140 overnight tells me we must have had thousands by now that have called and have said, I'm worried about myself. And, it, and we're not testing those, th we're not testing those people. Most of them are, if they have, you know, some concerns are probably being told, I assume, to self-quarantine or shelter in place or whatever it would be. And to monitor their health conditions. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. I, I would add that <clears throat> uh, KDHE Secretary Dr. Lee Norman is doing uh, maybe daily uh, briefings. I just watched his this morning. Uh, he indicated that they were doing a limited number a day, but now they were doing as much as 150 a day. And, but they're hitting their capacity with, with uh, and then he referenced the private as well and said that uh, they do a lot of pre-screening to make sure you have the symptoms. Otherwise, they, they refer you uh, to just keep monitoring and let us know. But if, if they don't have the symptoms, because he said they were doing a lot of tests that were uh, showing up negative, and although that's good news to some, it, it's, it's kind of wasteful. They want to they want to test you if you have the symptoms, is what his last message. But it's a good it's a good uh, five ten minute press briefing that that he gives. Looks like every day. So it's on the KDHE website. Okay. Any other questions? I was curious about the uh, the PPE equipment. Are we are we having a shortage of PPE uh, personal protection equipment? We are, um, we are, con we continue to seek those um, all different avenues. We're, we're trying to access the national stack stockpile. And as Tom mentioned, he put out a call to the private sector. And um, the hope is that there will be some folks that may be able to change their manufacturing practices to generate some PPE that we can then get into the hands of our first responders as well. So know? is that primarily for first responders or is that also hospitals, hospital staff? Do you know? I'm going to let Tom answer that. That'd be fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mims is in the room. Doctor, you want to welcome. Thanks for taking time out of your Sunday to come back and see us again. Uh, Dr. Mims and I talked earlier today, and, and I thought it was very uh, worthwhile for him again to... Uh, he is the uh, uh, our official health administrator for for us, and uh, thank you again for being here. And you're welcome. Share with us what you uh, what your latest observation and thoughts and information is, please. Well, we're very fortunate that Cedric County has only seen one case that we think was acquired here in Cedric County. The other case we've seen, we think acquired it outside the state and brought into the state. So at this point, we have some evidence there is intra-county transmission, but it appears to be in a very low state, and we haven't seen any sense. So while it's not good news, it's also good news in the sense that we haven't seen a surge of people coming down within this county who got it here in this county. We know the first person got it here because she hasn't left the county. At least she says she hasn't traveled, so we're pretty sure she must have got it from someone here. So it is here in the county, but at a very low level, which is good news. Um, as in contrast to our colleagues up north in uh, Johnson and Wyandotte County, we're seeing a considerable intra-county transmission. So 
we'll see. However, if you look at the map, we're starting to see it in other rural counties here and there. So it is here in the state. It's, it's spreading, but at a slow rate. Okay. And um, we talked briefly about any further, uh, at this point, uh, guidance that, that you would prefer or you, you indicated you didn't want to make a... Uh, a stand, whatever it's called, what it's called, another another order as of today, but tell us how you feel with where we should go. You know, if I had my preference, we would isolate everyone totally and shut the city down. Okay. And then wait for a vaccine to appear in a year and a half. <laughs> but I realize the consequences of doing that would be probably worse than the disease. Right. The economic and political and social consequences of doing that would, would be worse than just letting everybody get the disease. And I say that very considered, <laughs> but a year and a half of shutting the city down, that's impossible. Possible to do, and the economic ramifications would be terrible. So my point is, I think we're doing a pretty good jo job now of educating the people, and I'm really proud that there's a number of people who have taken heed without any coercion. A number of the restaurants are doing drive-through only now. Some of the stores have just shut, and for two weeks at least. Right. So I, I, I think the community has actually come along pretty well, and maybe that's why we're not seeing much increased activity beyond this one patient. At least in my opinion, Americans are much more compliant when they feel like they've been informed and they've had a chance to make a decision voluntarily, and I think that's what we're seeing. And yet we're still maintaining our manufacturing companies for the most part. Some of them, as you know, have decided to shut down on their own. We didn't tell them to do that, but they're doing that on their own. So I would prefer at this point to continue that and monitor it if we start seeing an upsurge in cases, we may have to consider that. But as of today, the 22nd of March, I think it's better to do what we're doing, asking the public, educating them, having a number of sessions through the media, TV, other media, explaining what the disease is and why it's so important that we observe these recommendations about social distancing, washing, reducing their activity in the community to as low a level as possible. Right. I think Commissioner O'Donnell had a... Yes, I did. Dr. Menz, thank you mm -hmm. for um, coming here today mm -hmm. for your very measured and um, expert advice mm -hmm. on what we need to do as a community. Um, I got a message earlier from my friend uh, John Tomlin, Dr. Tomlin mm -hmm. from WSU, and mm -hmm. he had brought up the fact that uh, Bloomberg had put out an article today about how companies mm -hmm. um, and organizations like NIAR that have defense work that mm -hmm. the Pentagon mm -hmm. has urged them not to shut down mm -hmm. for national security reasons. So, so that was one of the issues, but I think you just answered that. The other one was I had friends last night that were texting me saying, Hey, do you want to go out? You know, so what about bars and restaurants where maybe it's around 50 people, but definitely above 10. Do you have an expert opinion on that? Should we go down to a, a um, number of 10? for our restaurants, bars? I would have no objection to that. As you know, there's some even disagreement at the federal level. Right. <laughs> some I, feel 50 is fine, but others feel we should go down to 10, and I think that would be reasonable. Instead of a shelter-in-place or stay-at-home policy definitely. going down? Oh, definitely. I don't think we're ready for shelter-in-place. Okay. That, that's really good to hear. Thank you, Dr. Menz. Okay. Yeah. So my, my question is, um, you know, as many of us are at home, and uh, last night I just took a drive through our city, and I will say that um, a lot of places were shut down, but there were a lot of places that were still active. Mm -hmm. um, and so that concerns me, because really it doesn't matter the number of people, it just matters if that person has been infected with this. Mm -hmm. So it, you could be in a group of five and still be infected. Yes, and so we... You know, I, I would have to say that we are Midwesterners and we don't like to be told what to do. You're I know right. I don't. You're right. <laughs> and I think until we say something like a stay-at-home ordinance, 
I think people are still going to go out and mingle with their friends. They're absolutely, I mean, Commissioner O'Donnell said he got a text last night to go out. Mm -hmm. I think until we figure out a way to keep people at home for a period of time, we're going to see these levels increase. Would you, would you agree I, with that? I don't deny that we're going to see the levels increase. I don't think we can stop it unless we do what I just said. And I, I say we have to balance the consequences of trying to stop this increase or the disease period with the social economic consequences of doing that. That's my opinion. I, I would agree with you on one thing. I don't think the number is as important as educating people to keep the distance. I mean, if you have nine people in the closet and one of them's got it, they're going to get it. <laughs> But if they do like we're telling them to keep that separation, which I'm not sure we're observing the six foot, pretty close, pretty close. <laughs> Would it be your recommendation, though, if we do see, I mean, say we don't do anything or take any action, um, what is the consequence do you think like wh when would be that next step that you would take would it be a certain number of people that had been infected or what what would be your threshold to say i want to have a stay at home ordinance and act and that's a good question and i think we have to reevaluate this every day which is what dr norman's doing with his his session every morning and if we start seeing what johnson county's seeing i would say that we're getting close but we have to have a policy that is feasible. We can't have 20 exclusions. That all makes it ridiculous that almost anybody could go out based on the exclusions that they have put in some of these that I've seen. So it gets very difficult to not close the city down, everybody, and then you start making exclusions and pretty much you're pretty much back to stay within groups of nine and keep six foot distances between them. Uh, Dr. Benz, what I understand is what we're trying to do is bend the curve. That's right. We're not, we have no ability unless we shut everything down to stop this Correct. from spreading. Correct. So currently, uh, all the recommendations you're making are helping us bend that curve That's so right. that we can keep that curve to a level where that we're not overwhelming our medical facilities. Correct. 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 And that's where we're at today. Unless you come back with a different recommendation, that's where you recommend we stay, is helping us try and bend that curve. At this point, at least in Cedric County, we haven't seen that upstroke in the curve yet. Hopefully it will stay flat, but that means additional cases. But again, we cannot stop this. Johnson County cannot stop it. Seattle can't stop it. All we can do is slow its increments so that we don't overwhelm our hospitals until we have a vaccine or a medication. And I will add, with slowing it, that means it will probably last longer than it did in China. Because in there, they just let it go, essentially. I mean, they just exploded, and practically everybody got Not everybody, but that's what happens when you just let it go. And we're not talking about just letting it go. But we cannot stop it, but we want to keep that curve very low so the hospitals can manage those who get very ill from this, which is a minority. Very good. Thank you. And uh, if there is a change in what your uh, right. uh, decision is, we, we would certainly appreciate that as soon as possible. But for now, I, I understand what your concerns are, and, and I believe that that's probably the best path for us to take. Real question. Thanks, David. Uh, I, I'd like to just uh, uh, basically say I agree with what Commissioner Dennis just said. I think mm -hmm. he's right on the, his comments are exactly right. I am curious, in light of the fact that Johnson County did make a uh, another community restriction mm -hmm. that starts on Monday, um, are there hospitals, I don't know the status of their hospitals, are there hospitals feeling overwhelmed with this right now? Is that what's happening up in Johnson County? I don't think they feel overwhelmed yet, but they have been alarmed by the number of cases that keep coming in almost daily in Johnson County and Wyandotte County. So I think they're they're a little nervous right now. Uh, and of course, any decision we make today, we may not we may not feel the effect of that for a week or two. I would guess right. because there's right. a lag between mm -hmm. uh, change of behavior mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. the consequences of our hospital. But I think our hospitals, with the reduction of elective surgeries and mm -hmm. with with the really lack of cases in Sedgwick County at this point, 
um, only having, and I don't think there's anybody in, I don't think there's anybody in the hospital at this point no. in, in our Wichita regional hospitals yet. I'm sure that will happen, that won't change, right. but I, I if, that's our, if that's our trigger, though, it would be, it would be we got to be watching right. that to help us make this decision. And that's why we're reevaluating data. That's right. I talked to one of the hospital executives Friday, and he, he told me it's very quiet in the hospital <laughs> because they have shut down elective surgeries right. and they haven't seen any cases coming in, which they're okay with. They're happy that's quiet. Right. But my point is they have they have shut down things now, so they're ready. I guess my point is that that should be our trigger. So we'll right. watch what the hospitals are doing and help. Right. That should be one of our data points Correct. we're looking at to make decisions Correct. here. Okay. I just don't think we should wait until they're overrun to make a decision. And that is something that we, I mean, at daily, what would be our briefing? I would say when the hospitals start, I'm just speaking off the cuff now, but when the hospitals start seeing a number of patients being admitted to the ICUs and they, they've increased their capacity, so we're a long ways from overrunning them now. But when we start seeing a number of patients being in the ICUs on the ventilators, that's when we know it's coming. And that's when we would probably have to start looking at other measures. So if they have 150 screenings per day, where is that information? It's on the KDHE website, right? So if they're screening 150 people a day. He said they weren't going to report the the, uh, the negatives. They were just going to keep track of the positives. So I just, I'm just was watching today what he was saying. So, so, so Dr. Menz, the other day when I asked, maybe this is a question for Tim Kaufman, but, but we had talked about something like, we had evaluated 20 individuals in Sedgwick County. And was that Thursday or Friday, Tim? We talked about that. Um, Excuse me, Dr. We had assessed 20 at that right. time, and seven met criteria, right. tested seven, no what, positives. What's, what's the latest today? Have we had those 145 calls. I think we've worked through all of those. Oh, and we got tested out of those, though. Well, um, we're prepared to offer testing to three individuals. Three. Tomorrow, of based on the new criteria. Tomorrow. So there's only still been the seven. Correct. Because that's some of the Facebook messages that I'm, I'm trying to keep up with what people are asking. So we're still at the seven number. Correct. Thank you. Okay, doctor. So thank you for being here again. And, and we may have, if you can stick around just a little bit, we may have a little more. But thank you for your information. Next up. This is number uh, two out of four. So, Justin, address us, please. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Justin Wagon, our Assistant County Counselor. I was just going to briefly summarize the uh, order that's been discussed, I think, in some detail in uh, Johnson County, the Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte Unified Government, and also uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, just briefly summarize what that order did. Um, just because I know there's, it's been covered pretty extensively, uh, some of the media, it's also, they've had the largest outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, so the first thing to say is that they've come up with an order that uh, really directs people to stay at home and leave their residence only to perform certain essential activities. Uh, the, the order goes on, and it's from their local health officer. Um, you got uh, Tanya's passing out a copy of the Johnson County version, but they're essentially the same between the three governing bodies. But it's, it's a stay-at-home order, but then there it carves out a number of exceptions termed essential activities. Uh, those include things like essential government functions, like first responders, law enforcement, uh, those types of things, public health employees. Um, also, it lists a number of essential businesses. Uh, I, I know Dr. Minns just mentioned the number 20 on the number of exceptions. There's 25 in this one, so there are a number of exceptions that have been listed as to what type of businesses um, would be permissible there. Um, those are located on pages 3 and 4 primarily, uh, I think 3, 4, and 5 actually, um, of that order. Um, and, you know, it gets into a fair amount of detail as what those exceptions would be. Again, this was a, a, uh, a order just from their health officer. I think they convened in an en banc meeting with those three governing bodies this afternoon. I'm not sure as to exactly what the outcome of that was, but uh, at least in Kansas law, in the two counties that adopted this in Wyandotte and uh, Johnson County, these would have been effective upon the local health officer approving those. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have on this. But And, and I did watch that, that press conference today, and thanks. Uh, Mr. Papoon helped brief me as well. <clears throat> 
they had quite a challenge because they, they have two counties working together and then another third county that's in another state. So they had quite the challenge. So I can see why they embraced uh, a lot of uh, feedback to come up with this ordinance. Um, but at least it's one, albeit if we like it or not, it's, it's something to consider the skeleton of one, so, so to speak. So uh, thank you with, uh, with that so far. There's probably some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Justin, right. and I haven't been able to read over this, so, and I'm sure. sure you have. Is construction listed as an exemption or not? It is, Commissioner O'Donnell. Okay. Yes. Because I know that was a question that I received from people in the construction industry asking, because if they're taking good care of their, uh, you know, workers, making sure that road projects and stuff, they're on time restrictions for. That's correct. And I, I think, and I didn't get into a lot of detail, but I think the, the 25 exceptions that I mentioned could probably be summarized as activities that would be either essential, you know, like providing food at, you know, they, they allow restaurants to be open, but only for drive through or carry out. Uh, they allow grocery stores to be open so people can still have food. Um, they allow certain infrastructure type things or public health and safety, like electricians and plumbers, but items where maybe transmission of COVID-19 from one person to another seems pretty unlikely. So, I mean, they're, they're list all, although I mentioned that there are 25, and they definitely put some thought into it. You can tell that. So. Okay, what else? David? Jim, you got any questions so far? All right, just a minute. Okay, all right. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, thank you, Justin. Okay, Tom, what do we have got here up next? Potential actions. Commissioner, I think, at, I think at this time it's maybe time to offer you guys a chance to have a discussion. Um, it's a little bit awkward how we have to do it all. If Commissioner Howe gives me a high sign, I'll give you a high sign so that he wants to talk. Uh, but I think it's maybe time to have dialogue amongst the board, and we'll, if there's questions that come up during that dialogue, any one of us will attempt to answer. So. Okay, well, um, I'll just I'll lead it off only by saying um, I'm encouraged by... Uh, Dr. Men's observation that about our community, it does appear that our a majority of the community is trying to obey the obey the rules the best they can on the social uh, separations and uh, other other items. Um, we've had a lot of feedback. Uh, we all have had a lot of feedback to to get more restrictive and some to get less restrictive, and so there's a lot going on. From my observation, be glad to allow everybody, anybody else want to comment on some stuff. Yeah, I'll start the discussions, and I've seen a couple things on Facebook. I'd like to just have validated or whichever, however, however this conversation goes. I'll just see how it goes. Some people are talking about there, there have been credentials handed out to certain people in the community, giving them some type of exemption from any type of stay at home order that might be coming in the future. I'm not aware of that. Who would have handed that out here if anybody did? But uh, that, that is, is that true. The, the true? Wesley CEO validated it yesterday during his press conference that he had handed out that type of paperwork as a precaution. He was he emphasized he doesn't know what's going to happen, he doesn't know anything, but he thought it prudent to hand it out. So it was just for his staff, I assume. That it doesn't really impact. I mean, other businesses that uh, are interested in making making an, you know exemption uh, exemptions on certain staff. That it's not nothing to do with them necessarily. This is just Wesley and their staff specifically. That's correct, sir. In fact, the letter I saw that was posted online didn't even have a, an addressee to it. It was simply very generic. So, all right. The other question I'm getting a lot of questions on is if there's a stay-at-home order, is there what type of enforcement is allowed? I mean, is, I've heard things about possible uh, fines and jail time, potentially, for people to that would violate that stay-at-home order. And what's the legal authority for someone to uh, to uh, be out? Does is, is law enforcement have the right to pull people over and ask questions where they're headed? And I'm not exactly, exactly sure what they ask here, except for there's a lot of, a lot of concerns about uh, potential uh, restrictions on freedom. And, sure. and how does that play out in this, in this situation? Should, should that be something we have to talk about in the future? Thanks, Commissioner Howie and Justin Wagner, Assistant County Counselor. Uh, as to that question, I, I think we're, we're still looking into that some and want to have some further discussions uh, with uh, local law enforcement agencies on that question. Um, I think that it's worth 
remembering that the number one way to, uh, Dr. Menz got to this when he was discussing it, the number one way for this to be effective is for the public to do their part uh, to comply and not have large gatherings at this point. Um, and, you know, if it's a stay-at-home measure like is being done in the Kansas City area, it would be to stay at home. Um, you know, there, there may be various enforcement mechanisms, um, but enforcement can carry a bunch of different meanings, but one of those can simply be, uh, you know, law enforcement could say, hey, be mindful of uh, best practices, what the CDC guidance is, that kind of stuff. It doesn't have to mean it's locking people up and putting them in jail. So um, I, I don't have a pat answer as to X, Y, and Z is precisely what can be done. Um, but that we are looking at that more, Commissioner Howe. Well, just to the extent that it's already happening in our state, and it's something that's on the minds of people. And I'll get on this question almost, that's one of the most prevalent questions right now, is is this going to happen here? Of course, we don't know what the future holds here, but should it happen? And there's questions about constitutional freedoms, you know, in, in, uh, versus uh, what they use, kind of a police state mentality. So I don't know how to work all that out, but I guess I'm, very sensitive to the issue. I'd like to make sure we're, we're very, very thoughtful in how we do this, if this is in it all here. So um, I'll stop my questions for just a few minutes. Go ahead. Well, I think we bring up the commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, first of all, I, I appreciate the fact that we've had this briefing today. Uh, the last time that we got together was uh, on Friday morning, and, and uh, since that point in time, I, I've gotten emails that said, hey, don't shut down construction. I've got other emails that say, hey, shut down everything there is. Uh, uh, the main thing that th this does is uh, that it helps us educate the community on what the purpose of all these different things that we're doing is, and that is, again, as I said earlier, is to bend the curve. We need to remain calm. The public needs to under understand that the, uh, please don't go out and, and rush and buy all the toilet paper in the, in the, the uh, different grocery stores and so forth. Uh, uh, take this one day at a time. Remain calm. Uh, don't uh, take actions that don't make sense. Wash your hands. Keep your social distance. Uh, stay at home if possible, but we still have essential functions that have to remain, and we can't shut down those essential functions or we stop society, and we can't do that. So uh, I, I, I was worried, actually, over the weekend, and I talked uh, last night to the manager and to, today to the chairman, and I just believe that uh, I want them to understand we didn't shut down over this weekend. <laughs> And it, by having this meeting, we show we did not shut down. We're watching this every minute of the day. Each and every one of the commissioners uh, are getting feedback from all kinds of sources. Uh, we're sometimes in information overload, but uh, we are paying attention to what's happening. We'll do what's best for the community. We are the Board of Health, uh, and we will make the tough, tough decisions if we have to. But right now, we just want the people in the public, please remain calm. Wash your hands, keep your social distance, uh, take care of your families. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, I might just add that um, we're all in uncharted territory. Obviously, um, our goal is to fight this community spread. And uh, the words that, that I think we all need to be very careful with words we use. Um, in the, in the media supporting uh, the intent of the words because words like lockdown, shutdown, martial law. martial law, national guard, those are so inflammatory and so panic, so panic driven. And, and an ordinance such as stay at home, encouraging the public to stay at home with a certain amount of essential services, including defense contracts and, and major commerce impacts where where those companies are already practicing uh, distance distancing at the workstations and everything else uh, based on what Dr. Mim said earlier I think the community is and especially in the business community I think they're very aware of what they're trying to do I, I know that uh, well, I've talked to way too many businesses this weekend but they are all on top of it and uh, and each business thinks they're essential and for the most part, most of them are. But I do like the thought of, uh, of taking an advanced step with uh, a lot of, I've talked about four privately owned or personally owned uh, restaurants. They're pretty good with um, 
um, delivery, home or not home delivery, but pickup. And uh, and some of them are just wondering, what should I do with my staff? Am I allowed to let people in or not? And uh, so I asked, well, are you okay with takeout and call in orders? And pretty much they were. And they're all kind of getting there. Of course, we got the new rules coming up on April second with the uh, with the new federal uh, payroll and employment. Uh, that's right around the corner, so that might help uh, relieve a lot of the financial burden that's coming that's going to hit them all. So um, we got we got to try to, from my perspective, we got to try to let the medical community do their job uh, when uh, they're working overtime. They're in a lot of stress. Uh, doctor, it, it, uh, the CEO of Wesley said himself that you know some of his people are getting harassed at the grocery stores and whatever because they're wearing their scrubs, and uh, so it's a highly stressful time for them. Um, so I just want to try to avoid the infla inflammatory words that, that sometimes creep into easily to creep into our own minds. We got to be conscious of it and know that sometimes it gets sensationalized and it's it can be harmful to our to what we're trying to get done here and so yeah uh, michael you were going to say something yeah, yeah um for the manager so <clears throat> obviously there's all kinds of conspiracy theories and all kinds of um different news sources that we all get in our uh news feeds on facebook twitter uh social media but one of the things that we might want to look at i know that texas had released that their uh their county health departments and stuff if people have the the ppe the personal uh, protection equipment that they're buying them on the spot so if we could have some type of policy that if people have masks if they have things that we need that the county health department would be able to purchase those from people that may have stocked them up or old doctor's offices stuff like that so that we can have them but also for our hospitals so if there's any type of policy we can get with that and maybe that's something majority leader hawkins could ask the governor because i know that was from governor abbott down in texas but things like that that people might not think about that oh i have a hundred mask in my basement or whatever that that we understand they invested in that and we'll come up with the money to reimburse people uh by the action we took in last wednesday's meeting sir um we would do exactly that under the current regulation you have set for us i will tell you but we need to get that out to the public so that they know specifically we will buy these yes. from you I will, I, that's the last speaking point oh, i want to make sorry, sure. but sorry. No, you're, you're no. good okay that was my only thing chairman okay Oh, I know there was um, a nail salon. I mean, there's a lot of Facebook posts that um, have been put out that they're sending them to one spot. Is that what you're going to suggest? I mean, there was a nail salon that had like 3,000. I don't even know what they had. They had so many things that they um, were donating. Mm -hmm. um, so are, are you going to address where to, where to send those things? Yes. Thank you for that. Um, I guess I will just say, you know, I I hear what you all are saying, and I think that I just don't want to get to the point where all of our ICU beds are full. And at what point do we say, I mean, is it, you know, 50% of our ICU beds? Is it, I mean, what, what is the threshold, I guess? If we're not going to take action now um, with some sort of stay at home, what would be that level that our community would understand we're going to say, this is when we're cutting it off because we could have a surge and that's what we want to avoid. You know, on, on the call from the White House task force the other day, they said, if, if you feel like we're doing too much, we're probably just doing enough. And so I want us all to kind of remember that because we don't want to see high numbers. And if we take action now, I mean, if we leave bars open, people are going to go to bars. That's just, that's just the reality of our situation. Um, so, you know, I would say that I just want to know for sure, and no, I guess we can't know for sure anything, really. Um, but I just I want to know what those thresholds will be. If we're not going to take action today, which I do support taking action and figuring out some sort of stay-at-home ordinance, and I, I would implore all of us to really strongly consider that. We're not taking people's freedoms away. That's another buzzword that I think we have to avoid. This is, this is trying to protect our community and trying to give our healthcare workers the best chance that they can. Um, so that's, that's where I stand on this. Um, I would like to know um, from Dr. Menz, what, it, and you don't have to tell me now, but what would be the threshold in which that we would stop if we don't do anything today? Okay. Well, I think things like uh, um, looking at a, at a bar ordinance and a, and a restaurant to go only is 
seems to be something that's uh, important right now and would help further control the the community uh, the community spread. I mean, I'm sure there are other things. I mean, I heard sorry, conversations around um, oh, hardware stores and things like that. You know, if if we could set limits or or something, um, just to further show how serious we are about this. And we have been, I have been reading, I know you guys have been reading the reports of, um, I mean, it is a flood of information. So I, I hope that we're all taking this very, very seriously and reading more than one source. Um, I know we all have our trusted sources that we read all the time and that are flooding our, 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 our minds. But I mean, I think it's important for us to really take all of these numbers seriously. Yeah, I just have a couple uh, comments, and I, I, I appreciate the comments. I think we are taking it seriously. I do have one, just one clarification question. I want to go back to Dr. Mins for just a second. And maybe, maybe Tom, you can answer this question for him. It's fine. But is there actually a patient in our hospital right now that has COVID COVID nineteen, or is that that's some somebody, somebody that's I'll the last Tim, case they sheltered at home? What yeah. was the conclusion? I'll, I'll let Tim or Doctor correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have one patient who is at VA. Okay. Um, at, they were Friday, and we have one patient who was tested positive who, who is quarantined at home. Okay, that's 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 all I wanted to know with that. I, I do want to make a comment, and that is, I do appreciate the, the reasoned response of Dr. Mins and and the county staff. I think you, Tom, you've done a great job. I want to just commend you and thank you for your good work on this, and appreciate your leadership. Mm -hmm. And then I have just two comments for us to chew on as commissioners. I, I would like to tell you that. Um, one thing, there's two things I think we ought to do as a, as a commission, and I'm glad that uh, Majority Leader Hawkins is here because I think this might impact him as well. But I think we, as a commission, ought to make a re make ought to make a uh, an, an official request to the state of Kansas to move our property tax payment back one month. It's normally due. I think you say May the 10th. Is that correct, Tom? May the that's 10th. Correct, sir. Yes. I'd like to see us push that back to June the 10th. I think that's one thing we can do. To just put a little bit of relief in there, yeah, if, if people are struggling to come up with that money, give them some assurance, give them an extra month to pay that payment. I don't think it's going to hurt anybody in local government to, to see that date pushed back one month. Uh, second of all, I think we got to do a little bit more to communicate about our, our payment options. I know there are um, way, other ways to pay property taxes. We ought to make sure that that becomes a, uh, an item of communication. We've not talked about that very much lately, but this is a good time to bring that up. And the second really formal request I'd like to see us ask the state of Kansas is I'd like to see us go back to 2019 property valuations. I think we need to, there, right now, with 81% of the people having a 6% increase in Sedgwick County, and it's not just here, it's the entire state of Kansas, frankly, we would make 97% of the people very happy. Just simply, let's go back to last year's valuations. I think we can do it. I think we have to ask the state of Kansas to let us do that. And if that be a local decision or whatever, but at least give us some relief to leave the money back in the back, back in the pockets of people, rather than potentially have that drive into a tax increase this year. This is not the time for that. So, with all the people trying to do uh, uh, um, the informal hearings, trying to reduce their, their their property values, this is not a time for those meetings. I'd like to see us uh, try to just give that relief by going back to twenty back to twenty nineteen numbers. Dan, can give you all that information? Be fine. But as a commission, I think we ought to formally request that. Well. Well, we already have talked about that, and I think Dan has got better answer than any of us. Okay. Yes, Dan Hawkins, uh, House Majority Leader. Um, actually, I had sent an email to the governor's office this morning uh, about that issue. They don't believe that they have the authority to be able to do that. It would probably take legislation to do that. Um, so I spent a little bit of time talking with uh, my um, my peers in the leadership, uh, the speaker and the, the speaker pro tem this morning, and they were certainly worried. And I think I think probably just putting it back one uh, one month probably is not as difficult as going back to uh, the 2019 appraisal. Um, that that's probably going to um, cause some pretty good problems. I think if we do that. Uh, so we'll have to really think through that before we do that. Even that would probably take a legislative uh, fix it. It's not something that the governor could do within the powers that she has with an emergency declaration. I appreciate your answer. Please continue to think on it. And if there's anything we can do as a county, I'd like to have us potentially formally request that. I think we have to be.
doing what we can to provide some relief. And those are two things, very practical things we can do. We'll continue working on that and, and, and look at that. We, we uh, currently are not scheduled to go back uh, to session until April 27th. That's if uh, we can go back if uh, things aren't uh, really, really bad by then. Uh, so we hopefully we'll have some time that we can work on some of those things when we get back. Thank you so much. Any other comments right now? Okay, Tom. Okay. Um, commissioners, I want to advise you of one thing that um, I mentioned at the beginning that I did uh, last week. Uh, we have um, three, f first of all, right now I feel like um, we are poor in two areas, data and some very basic equipment. The data I think will come um, as, as the infection grows. We'll get better data now that it's American and we've got CDC working on it. But one of the things that we are short of that we talked a little bit about is test kits and the testing reagent to um, conduct analysis of what's going on in our community. Uh, everything that I've read, and we've all read a lot of information, but what makes a lot of sense to me is what South Korea did, where they were testing people as they became positive, but they also had random tests going on in the community all the time. Uh, we should be out in our community now testing randomly to get some kind of feel for how we uh, are set across this community with the rate of infection. We don't have the equipment to do that. We don't have the sampling kits, and as Tim talked about, we don't have the testing reagent and the KDHE capacity to do that right now. And once we get national labs up, it may help, but national labs are gonna be busy. This is, if you see what's going on in New York and Chicago and in DC, it's, it's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, infection. So um, I reached out to uh, GWP and the chamber in the middle of last week and I went through um, a series of uh, pleas, and I'm not too proud to plead for our people. Uh, number one was protective masks and protective gloves. And there's two kinds of masks I asked for. One is the, the mask you hear a lot about, the N95 mask, uh, which provides pretty good uh, protection for the virus. And even surgical masks, which is a lesser protection, but still gives some capacity for protection. We've asked for this supply for weeks. Um, we're getting some trickling in, but not enough of what we're gonna need in this community in the next few weeks. Uh, I've also asked for hand sanitizer, and that sounds easy, but you can't find it on the shelves at Dillon's or, or Costco now. You can't find it on the internet, because I've looked. Um, and just basic cleaner um, to spray on a tabletop to, to, uh, uh, to clean it. Uh, and, and then the test kits that I talked about. So I put the plea out to um, GWP in the chamber for those items. Uh, I think hand sanitizers, if you're watching around the country, uh, any company that is a distillery or a brewery, uh, as Dr. Gallagher will often say, there's big chemistry labs, and they have the capacity to make hand sanitizer. Um, I think our private partners out there are getting mixed messages from the multiple sources of message out there that everything's in route, it's going to get there, we'll have enough. And we've been patient for two weeks, but that's not reality. So I think it's time to call in our private partners and, and have them come and help us. And I'm talking about private partners in the state of Kansas and Sedgwick County and Wichita. Um, I've had a, a contact this morning, for example, um, of a company in Hutchison that has the capacity to create, manufacture, and distribute 1,000 N95 masks a day if we can get them the tool and we can get them the specs to get that done. So we're fleshing through those kinds of things. Um, but that's exciting. That would mean a lot for uh, our health workers. It would mean a lot for our emergency workers, our sheriff, our, our EMS. So I ask today that you support this, um, uh, and I ask the media to support this, that we are reaching out to our uh, our private partners to, to step up and help us because we're not getting it at a fast enough rate from national stockpile. And quite frankly, there are cities in this country that are hurting way more than we are. Look at what's happening in New York and DC, Chicago, they're hurting. So clearly what, what there is in national capacity is gonna be funneled to those large cities. So we have to fend for ourselves in the state of Kansas. Um, 
I have a triangle drawn that talks about what, if we could get this basic equipment, what this means. Uh, clearly at the, top of the, at the top of the triangle is hospital and emergency workers and our emergency responders who are out dealing every day right now with um, potentially infected people. We have got to protect them. But there's a whole series of people underneath that. Um, went to Dillon's today and there's a checkout person there who is having a thousand contacts. She has no protective equipment on. If she had an N95 mask on, she could do her job and she could do it safely. We need to do what we can to get her that equipment. And her employer needs to do what they can to get her that appointment. I think they look to us to give, to give leadership and guidance on this. When we talk about whatever the next discussion is, um, whether we do a, and I get the, the language here, but if we do a stay at home kind of uh, approach to Dr. Menz's point to do the best we can to stop the spread, we all know that there's gonna be certain businesses that have to run. We have to keep food supply up. There's certain manufacturing that has to happen. Plumbers and electricians have to, things are gonna break in homes, they have to go fix. Um, mechanics at garages have to keep our vehicles running. Right now they have to go in and have no equipment. They have no protective equipment. We have to try our best to get protective equipment so we can continue to operate these kinds of essential functions. So um, I make that plea today and I, I, we're working on it. I'm hoping something uh, provides uh, fruit within the next few days, but I just wanted to make you aware that we did it uh, and that we're trying for it. And I, and I ask for your support that um, we do what we can for the state of Kansas during this time. Right. Tom, I, I, uh, I think it's prudent on us to, uh, re now that we have the Kansas City model, which is, again, between Kansas City area and Wichita, that's half the population and more than half of the state's economy. I think the state would, would and the, well, our citizens for sure would appreciate if we came up with, uh, if we could review this, especially the definitions of essential businesses, and if we could communicate, it, it took that community, even a, a three county en banc type stuff to get done, mm -hmm. which I'm sure was a lot longer steps than we have contacts with our own businesses and our own, uh, uh, even our nonprofit providers. Um, I know that Lord's Diners handing out meals every night. Uh, they're not congregating. May we get? Can we get some input with the theory of we we need to do a stay at home ordinance that has has some teeth and has some guidance and encouragement. And uh, I don't know if by Wednesday if we could have a a draft of something for us to at least have a, a feedback on. Because uh, I'd like to review all these 25 as well, personally. But we need to get engaged. If it is the laundromat or whatever, we need to to hear what what they have to say. That's a lot of a lot of work. I don't know if two days we can get this done. But as Dr. Min says, if we're not if we're still plateauing, maybe we've got this 24, 48 hour, 72 hour gray period to to really evaluate. Uh, and be consistent with our own state partners in our in our population centers. Uh, do you think that's possible to uh, to look into? It's Sunday night. Can we have it by Wednesday, <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mike Papoon, County Councilor. We will have a draft for you by Wednesday of a possible stay-at-home resolution that or an order that Dr. Menz could sign and approve by the Board of Health here. So. Well, thank you. And I think Via Christie and, and Wesley and Dr. Menz and, and Adrian, medical side, are major employers. I'm sure I was on the phone with our three largest employers today. I know they would they would dedicate somebody to to have their opinion about what they feel is uh, the impact. And they so at least we have uh, some, and then we can regroup and and. Uh, I don't know what the will of the rest of the commission is. I would still like to to look at something. Okay. I, I think, uh, Chairman, to your point, I think it's prudent for us to talk to our partners. Yeah. Um, the cities, especially Wichita City, the biggest city in the state. Yeah. Um, our, our manufacturing, uh, our trades group, I think it's prudent to do that. I know that, and I know the counselor works directly for you, but I hope we can do better than Wednesday. I hope we can get you information sooner than that, but we will make Wednesday the goal. But I would like to ask that you consider a special meeting 
as soon as we're ready to present that information because I think it's important. It's the most yeah. important thing we're doing right, right now. No, Wednesday so. may be too late. If we can get that stuff done in the next 24 hours, would be uh, really good. We will really do the best good. we can, sir. But including, let's look at restaurants, or I mean the bar, the bar scene, um, and then the restaurant to go, even the bars to go. Um, maybe uh, consider or not the 50 to 10 group. I know Kansas City's done that. I'd like to see what we could try to digest. Well, I know Mike and his legal staff will work on that, but I will assign other staff to reach out to partners, and I'll do what I can myself. But we'll. This is um, it's the most important thing we're doing right now. Right. So it is terribly important. So, uh, Commissioner okay. Hall, I just want to make back up with you. Did I answer your question that I delayed before? No, you, you, you did fine. Okay. That's good. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for taking part of the Sunday out. I think this is helpful for us to get together and catch up. And uh, Dr. Mims, thanks for being here. Mr. Hawkins, for sure. You're always welcome, as you know. Thank you, Legal and Tim and everybody for being here in the media. Appreciate it. So uh, we will, uh, Tommy, have anything else to close with? Okay. Okay. Well, we'll let's get through this. Okay. Thank you.